Welcome to the Daily Dispatch. To kick off today's dispatch, there's no better news than the exhilarating final between Argentina and France. That's how Lionel Messi lift the trophy. We'll also be covering fresh controversy surrounding the World Cup hosted by Qatar. Next, we'll be covering the World Bank's analysis of the lingering effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the world. And finally, for our last headline, we'll be breaking down how a meeting between the Chinese and Australian foreign ministers is going to be critical in shaping the future of their bilateral relations. We're here to give you news and to help you infer the world around you. I'm Osama Nezamani, and here's your Daily Dispatch. If you've been living under a rock and haven't heard, the FIFA Men's Football World Cup Final just saw an exhilarating match between Argentina and France last night. Lionel Messi won his first World Cup title, cementing his legacy as one of, if not the best players ever to have graced the game. But for some, another winner of the World Cup has been the small desert state of Qatar, which has been in the limelight since the start of this World Cup and pulled off one of the most spectacular FIFA events in recent decades, despite controversies regarding human rights violations and manipulation of votes to get hosting rights surrounding the tournament. It built seven new stadiums, including Al Bayat, a venue designed to look like a Bedouin tent, and other major infrastructure, and hired football stars and film celebrities to support the World Cup in Doha. Keen observers could not miss the presence of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman at the opening ceremony as he sat beside Qatar's Amir, Sheikh Tamim bin Hama Al Thani. Three years ago, Doha faced a blockade by Saudi Arabia and its Gulf allies. It's also important to mention the Men's Football World Cup's two best players and finalists, Messi and Mbappe, played in the same football club, Paris Saint Germain, which is owned by Qatar. But the controversy around the World Cup has barely died down. Before new accusations are being made by European Union against Qatar for influencing decisions in the European Parliament, a Belgian judge has charged four people over allegedly receiving money and gifts from Qatar to influence decisions in the European Parliament. Prosecutors searched 16 houses and seized 600,000 euros in Brussels on Friday as part of an investigation into money laundering and corruption. Qatar rejected this allegation, stating the country categorically rejects any attempts to associate it with accusations of misconduct. It is also important to note, these allegations come at a time when Doha's significance as an alternative energy source for European states has increased, with the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war affecting energy supplies. Next up, the dispatch takes you on to the post-COVID world. The World Bank's latest economic review has called 2022 a year of uncertainty. The lingering effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, along with climate shocks and conflicts such as Russia-Ukraine war, have hindered economic recovery, contributed to education losses, increased poverty, and added further challenges for developing states. The world has made significant improvements over the last three decades in eradicating extreme poverty, with a 30% of the global population living in extreme poverty in 1990. Since then, extreme poverty across the globe has come down to 8.4% in 2019. But in 2022, this reduction in extreme poverty has slowed down. According to World Bank, more than 680 million could be living in poverty by the end of this year, making 2022 the second worst year in the past two decades for poverty reduction. And it is now estimated that 7% of the world's population will still live in extreme poverty in 2030. The earlier target was to reduce it to just 3%. Moreover, recent years have also seen a steep rise in debt crises, especially for developing countries. For example, in 2021, overall debt levels have increased for developing countries, with some 60% of the world's poorest countries either in debt distress or at a risk of it. In parallel, the composition of debt has also undergone a significant shift, with private sectors holding more than 60% of public debt, it is important to mention that Sri Lanka, which defaulted on its debt in May 2022, owed most of its debt to private creditors. High debt levels for developing countries will shrink fiscal space to invest in education, health, and infrastructure. 
and will undermine economic recovery, which has already been hit by climate shocks like floods in Pakistan and drought in the Horn of Africa, affecting millions of people. And for our final headline on the dispatch, Australian Foreign Minister Penny Wong will meet her Chinese counterpart Wang Yi this week, with experts suggesting that this could be a huge step towards improving diplomatic relations between the two powers if the visit ends up being constructive. It will be the first visit by an Australian minister to China since 2019 and coincides with the 50th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Beijing and Canberra. In recent years, bilateral relations between the two countries have deteriorated due to heavy tariffs on exports and mutual accusations of military buildup. In the past, Beijing has also raised concerns over Australia's defense posture and being part of the US alliance in the Indo-Pacific region. Australia is part of the Quad as well as AUKUS, a partnership established in 2021 between the US, the UK, and Australia. Beijing considers these developments as part of US strategic efforts to undermine China's security in the region. However, despite the continued strategic competition, trade ties between Australia and China have increased over the years. China is Australia's largest trading partner, both in import and export, while Australia is China's fifth largest source of imports and its 10th biggest export market. In 2021, the bilateral trade stood at $231.2 billion. Beijing and Canberra also have a free trade agreement, China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, signed in 2015. Despite this, the economic ties have also faced a strain over the years, with Australia voicing reservations regarding making China a part of the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Pact. Formed in 2018, it currently has 11 members, with the trade pact removing 95% of tariffs among its members. Participation requires the support of all members. Similarly, in May 2020, China imposed heavy tariffs on a number of Australian exports, wheat, wine, coal, barley, and lobster, among others. Reducing the strain of strategic competition and economic ties will be high on the docket, with both countries hoping they can move past previous frictions, including COVID allegations and bans on China's telecommunication company, Huawei. We're also bringing you other essential news from around the world. China officially confirmed two COVID-19 related deaths after the government rolled back stringent anti-COVID measures earlier this month in response to anti-government protests over the strict measures. And these deaths have sparked concerns and fears of an inevitable and speedy virus spread. In fact, many believe that the actual death count is more than just two, with Western news outlets suggesting that China is underreporting its COVID-related deaths. China's currently reported death toll is far lower than countries with more widely vaccinated population that have gone through reopening waves. And some are citing the way China is now qualifying deaths from COVID as one of the reasons. Previously, anyone who passed away while COVID positive was counted as COVID death. But new guidance was issued on December 6 that reports some people as dying from underlying illness despite reporting COVID positive. According to the chief epidemiologist at China's Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Wu Jinyu, China is likely to experience three infection waves from now till mid of March, and with some experts suggesting that these waves can lead to almost a million deaths in the worst case scenario. These new waves will be significant threat to China's population, as well as its economy and China's global partners that rely on its manufacturing services if mass lockdowns become necessary once more. Also, yesterday, we told you about the terrorist outfit Tariq e Taliban and how it is ramping up terrorist attacks in Pakistan. Today, we bring you more updates. 15 militants locked up at the Banu Counterterrorism Department in Pakistan's northwestern province, Khabar Pakhtunkhwa, took over the compound and freed 35 militants. Security officials have been taken hostage as a bargaining chip, with the militants demanding safe passage to Afghanistan. Since then, special assistant to the KP chief minister, Barrister Muhammad Ali Saf, has claimed the situation is under control and security forces have started an operation. We'll keep you updated as more news develops. In a separate incident, 
Four policemen were also killed in an overnight attack by militants in the Bargai village of Lucky Marva district in KP province. According to a police official, militants attacked with hand grenades and automatic weapons. This was the fourth attack on the police in the past month. Multiple attempts to broker peace with the terrorist outfit have been made by the Pakistani government. However, the TDP unilaterally terminated the ceasefire agreement at the end of November and directed their workers to conduct terror attacks in Pakistan, targeting civilians as well as security forces. Policy analysts hold a consensus that the TTP has misused this attempt by the Pakistani government to bring an end to the conflict, employing it as a strategic pause to regroup. While these attacks remain contained to a few parts of KP, the Pakistani government has redoubled its efforts to uproot the outfit's presence in the country, suggesting it will refuse to return to the dark days where Pakistan suffered massively from terrorism spilling over into the country from Afghanistan during the war on terror. However, while the TTP continues to have a base of operations in Afghanistan, experts say it will remain a challenge for Pakistan to eradicate the terrorist threat. And to round out the dispatch, in a meeting with visiting Nicaraguan Foreign Minister, Dennis Moncada in Tehran, Iran's parliamentary speaker, Mohammad Bakir Khalibaf, called out the United States for using cruel sanctions as a tool to pressurize countries that divert from its policies or stand against it. Both Iran and Nicaragua have faced unilateral sanctions from the US over the past decades, but sanctions on Iran intensifying in 2018 when President Donald Trump pulled out of a nuclear deal between Iran and world powers that had been in effect since 2015. Similarly, Nicaragua has faced sanctions and pressure from the US, with the experts marking both its human rights violations and its close ties with United States strategic rivals such as Russia and China as reasons for friction with the US. During the meeting, the Nicaraguan foreign minister also labeled cooperation between the countries essential, citing the ongoing efforts to advance bilateral relations and increase their reciprocal support in the face of common enemies. Issues like the economy, agriculture, energy, and technology were also in the agenda as the two officials met. It's important to remember, this news comes as Iran faces increased pressure from the West over its nuclear program, as well as backlash from Western countries over the ongoing protests over women's rights. That's all folks, we'd love to hear your suggestions and feedback. We'll be back tomorrow with more bite-sized news that keeps you up to date with what's going on in the country, the region, and the globe. I'm Osama Nizamani, and this was your Daily Dispatch.